Good morning. It's about 11 o'clock. We'll go ahead and get, get started with our next presentation. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all, especially if you're just joining us. Welcome to the first ever Winter Wonder presented by Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. If you're here from an earlier session, welcome back. Uh, my name is Jill Starowski and I'm the lead park ranger for Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. Um, please know that if you're looking for today's schedule, you can check out our Eventbrite page or the Facebook pages. Uh, you'll find both links in the chat. You'll see that chat feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. Now you may have heard that by attending these presentations, you can earn a very special Winter Explorer Junior Ranger badge. So if you're looking to do that, what we'll need you to do is send us a message uh, letting us know which of the presentation or if you went to multiple presentations that you attended and along with a short statement with something that you learned. Um, so you can send that to our email, which again will be in the chat, or you can message us on our Facebook or Instagram pages. So for our next presentation, we're going to be looking at interpreting nor'easters, illustrating coastal change and storm response. Herring Cove, P Herring Cove Beach in Provincetown is a great place to explore how a popular beach facility responds to the cycle of storm tides and waves and how nor'easters and hurricanes drive coastal change. Researchers have visited the barriers, spits, dunes and marshes in both calm and stormy conditions and created a video to explain responding to coastal change through sustainable planning. They hope the public will have a role in interpreting natural forces and responding to accelerated changes to come as sea level rises and storms increase in frequency. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you now to our presenter. Mark Adams, who is a GIS and coastal specialist with Cape Cod National Seashore. Mark has worked for the National Park Service at Cape Cod since 1993 as a cartographer and coastal specialist. He has also worked on details and project teams at Grand Tetons, Yosemite, Acadia, Assateague, and Fire Island, in addition to emergency response on oil spills, hurricanes, and wildfires. Mark is also a gallery artist, teacher, and mentor, and while he's based on the Cape, he has visited the Boston Harbor Islands a number of times, once to look for New England cottontail rabbits. A little bit about how this presentation will proceed, we'll go ahead and ask that you save your questions until the end of the presentation. You'll notice that at the bottom of, the, of your screen, there's a button for a Q&A panel. If you have a question that comes up in the presentation, feel free to type it at that moment in the Q&A and we'll, we'll look through those at the end of the presentation. You're also free to write them in our chat or if you prefer, um, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you and you can ask your question live. A final note is that the presentation is being recorded and if you'd like to either turn on or turn off the closed captioning, that's also a feature you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Mark, welcome to Winter Wonder. I'll pass the presentation off to you. Oh, I think you're still muted. There we go. Okay, thank you. It's really great to be here. Thanks, Jill, and thanks everybody. Um, here on the Cape, we like to enjoy winter. Um, when it's safe, we like to go out and see what's going on on the coast and how the storms are affecting us. Uh, sometimes it's very real. Um, I'll just throw in a personal note that my um, my boiler, my furnace blew up the other day uh, and uh, my power has gone in and out. Uh, that might not be normal for the Cape, but it certainly is normal for me at the moment. But the presentation goes on and I uh, um, hope you'll enjoy this. Um, I'm going to give show a few slides and tell about the origins of this project. And then I'm going to show a video, which is a work in progress that we're making to try to uh, dramatize and bring people in to the story of storm changes um, on all of our coasts. So let me, uh, let's see, share my screen. Let's share, uh, let's see this one, share, and I'll talk through a few slides. Um, let's see, how are we doing here? Let's go from, Sorry about this. All these toolbars are in the way here. There we go. Okay, so um, this project started from, uh, uh, let's see, a, a project that's 
that's going on in several national parks in uh, Boston Harbor Islands, Cape Cod, and Acadia through researchers at University of Rhode Island School of Oceanography and also visual information specialists um, at uh, Penn State and RISD grad students. And while they're developing this sort of flooding model of our storm coasts, uh, we're also trying to create a, a way to explain this in a real um, and um, uh, kind of entertaining way so that, um, so that you know, the information is available to people to kind of put in their own context. And uh, the study itself creates these elaborate models that take into account wind and waves and exposure. And, um, and the video that I'm gonna show at the end is about eight minutes actually. And again, it's an attempt to bring you into the space where these things happen. Um, well, a, a little bit of context. Um, the coasts of both Boston Harbor Islands and Cape Cod are inside the Gulf of Maine, which is its own little circulation system. And why is that important for storm, to understand storms and coastal change? Well, you know, we have some of the biggest tide ranges in the world, uh, particularly up in the north in Nova Scotia, but also on Cape Cod, you know, and in Boston, we have 10 to 12 foot tidal ranges. So anything that happens, any storm surge is gonna be on top of whatever the tide's doing at the moment. So we have all these factors that bring water onto our coast and create the waves and energy that might reshape things and that we might have to prepare for. Um, I also um, I just throw this in as an artist, I've thought a lot about how we, how we make this information visual. And so this is a, a, a floor map that I made that I painted uh, about a 30 foot map of the Gulf of Maine that you could walk around on and see where the deep areas are, see where the continental shelf is, and see where we are, where Cape Cod and Boston and the coast of Maine are in the, um, in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so that was fun. And then also, how do we measure coastal change? Well, we're very lucky on Cape Cod because this gentleman on the left, Henry Marenden, came in the 1890s and established a bunch of coastal elevation stations all around the Cape. And we've continued to measure those. We have some of his notebooks from the 1890s. Um, and we've continued to measure those with our sophisticated GPS techniques and also with aerial surveys from LIDAR, which is a laser-based scanner, which tells us the elevations. And knowing the elevations is really important because it tells us how much sand is on the beach and how that sand moves around. And the sand is our defense against uh, severe coastal change. Um, also, I just throw this in this little tower. This is a uh, signal tower. It um, was used in those, some of those early surveys. This is 1906. But when you watch the video, at the end of the video, you're going to see, I'm going to kind of like give away uh, the punchline here a little bit, but those concrete footings on that tower are what have appeared um, as a result of some of our recent nor'easters. And they're now a marker of what those changes have been in a the scale of a century. Um, so here's a, a, a nor'easter. What is a nor'easter? Well, let's see. It's, um, uh, it's basically, uh, it's a winter storm on, on, in the Northeast. Um, it's different from hurricanes uh, in that uh, it's driven by the collision of warm, and, of warm ocean air uh, into the colder polar air masses that are coming as a part of a regular weather pattern. And they're called nor'easters. Really, it's a compass point, right? It's what they use to teach the points of the compass in the early days of navigation. Um, let's hear um, something, sort of a direct comparison between hurricanes and nor'easters. So nor'easters are basically cold air. It's a cold, cold air cyclone. And it originates in the Atlantic and moves northeast. It gets its energy from the temperature difference in the air as the air masses collide. And one thing that we know very well is that these are long storms. Sometimes they last several days. Uh, wind speeds may not be as high as a hurricane, but they actually can be much more damaging. Um, these are the, the spurts of energy that drive coastal change. And they're very frequent. You know, we name hurricanes. We don't often name uh, nor'easters. Maybe we will as they become more frequent. Um, and so what are the areas that are vulnerable? Well, the, 
on the uh, right, you see one of our old parking lots at Herring Cove. And you're gonna see in the video that we've rebuilt that parking lot, set back from the beach um, about 200 feet. Um, it was in the intertidal zone as a part of the coastal process and it really couldn't exist there. In the, the general map, now you can see the relationship between the Boston Harbor Islands and Provincetown. Now, it, it's not something, unless you've sort of taken the uh, puddle jumper and flown across, you don't really understand exactly the orientation. The Cape is a bit south of Boston, uh, but within the Gulf of Maine, we're receiving a lot of that same storm energy. The energy pathways are, uh, are similar. Um, so here's just a few of the components of the model. I'm not gonna really go into these, but there's um, rain. There's uh, forcing of the uh, flow of water in the in the channels. There's um, atmosphere. There's the the, the wind, um, the wind in the atmosphere. There's wave modeling, and for this model, they've created these grids, um, and the grid tells you basically the computer puts together all of those components of wind, wave, um, and atmosphere, uh, and each cell in that. Uh, in that grid uh, has a solution to what wave energy, what um, storm energy is going to occur in, a, in a, a given storm in this model. So you can kind of click on a point theoretically and get uh, the outcome of the storm and how that particular cell in the grid is going to affect uh, that part of the shoreline. And we know that some of our shorelines are more vulnerable than others. There's steep slopes, there's uh, sandy beaches, there's these quiet marshes behind the, uh, the, the dunes uh, that can be inundated in a storm. So it's really important for managers to know what the energy would be in each square of the model. Uh, let's see, and then the model is sort of corrected. It's taught, we teach the robot uh, based on real life experience, based on real storms. So there's um, uh, water level stations and wind speed stations that tell us you know, what actually happened when a storm came. Uh, here's our, the end of the Cape. Many of you in Boston come to the Cape. Um, Provincetown uh, has a bunch of popular beaches and uh, marshes and nature areas, as does the entire Cape. And you can see the areas that are vulnerable to flooding um, in the basically the colors. Uh, and these are what we're modeling, what we're looking at. It's interesting to see that the airport is in, as many airports are, as as Logan Airport is, are in the flood zone. They're in a floodplain. Um, but also, we're also concerned about the systems of the marshes and how uh, na how natural systems create the nursery grounds for fish and shellfish, and uh, so that um, those can evolve with storms and still stay productive. So yeah, again, just a couple more. This is uh, just sort of part of the model, a, a, a visualization of the air, of those flooding areas in the Outer Cape in Provincetown. And here's uh, uh, just sort of some of the um, visual representations of flood energy of flooding uh, on one of the Boston Harbor Islands. So now I'm gonna switch to the video and uh, Let's see, let's, where's the video? Here it is. And uh, let's, I'm gonna click this and just uh, sit back and enjoy and then uh, um, be happy to hear your questions. Again, the whole point of this is to try to make this real and give you a visceral understanding of um, nature and storms. So let's see, let's do this and do an interface screen. This is a fantastic way to understand how waves and tides shape the landforms and beaches of Cape Cod. Hey, Mark, if you're able to unshare, um, oh, sorry, point and then reshare the video. Okay, right. Uh, let's see. Stop, everyone, bear with me. Um, let's see, screen share. New share. Uh, there it is. No, that's not it. Uh, oh, come on. Is 
that must be it. Okay. No, that's not it. <laughs> I had this all down. Um, one moment. Should be this one. Mark, do you want to reshare your screen? Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, too many windows open. Okay. Share screen and um, this one. And share. Okay, how's that? All set. And uh, let's see, let's go to full screen somewhere. Oh my goodness. Here we go. Okay, tell, tell me if this is okay. How's that? This is a fantastic way to understand how winds and tides shape the landforms and beaches of Cape Cod. As you can see, we have three to five foot waves in Cape Cod Bay. It's high tide. And then um, if you feel the sand below my feet, you can feel that it's constantly moving. Standing here today, I can almost see the cape changing shape with these waves. Oops. So we're here at the north end of Herring Cove uh, with Hatches Harbor in the background. This is a really interesting place, both from for scientists, from a coastal geology point of view, and it's a fun place. It's a place people like to come because of the variety of landforms, because of the, the, the pools of water, and because of the fact that it's changing all the time. You can kind of see this beautiful tree, this fish, and uh, those are formed from this. These are little particles of granite. This is quartz granite. This is the Appalachian Mountains. This is- um, Hey, Mark, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ruby, what's up? Hi. <laughs> um, well, we're making a little video, which you just yeah. found. Oh, I'm so sorry. What's the video about, though? <laughs> no, it's great. I'm glad you're here. Um, we're doing a science project where we've given scientists all of the data about the coastal landforms here, the location of the buildings and the pavement, and they're actually creating storms in the computer to see what happens in certain kinds of storms. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. So you come in speech, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, recollections of how it's changed over time? Definitely. When we were, me and my friends were younger, we'd come in here and play in the river that was created. And during like low tide, we'd ride it on boogie boards. But now it's definitely changed a lot because I don't remember being this big or like far back in the beach um and i remember being more connected to the ocean so it's kind of crazy to see how much it's changed only a couple of years yeah yeah there's a lot of new sand that's coming here push the sandbars onto the beach so what are they going to do with the flood models oh uh, okay so we're really interested in how the inundation of these storms is going to affect our parking lots and buildings and roads down the line there's even the the highway and the town are affected by this stuff the flood model will kind of help us predict and not be surprised by disasters <laughs> exactly are you going this way yeah because yeah let's go I, let's go check it out i want to i want to you know i'm really curious what you think about yeah 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 totally. yeah So what do you think? I don't know. I think that there still will be beach. I think the beach just move. <laughs> so there's this river of sand in the near shore that's being pushed by each wave. And that river of sand gets deposited here and makes a new beach. Even after a big storm and a lot of erosion, there's more sand being dropped off. Do you ever think like someday you're going to come here and there's going to be no more beach? 
Um, sometimes I worry about it, but I always feel like that in general, there's got to always be a beach, I think. I think that it probably just changes where the beach is every summer and after all the winter storms. With sea level rising storms, though, the beach is, is receding. The dunes move, the beach, the high tide line moves. There used to be an old bathhouse there that was built kind of in response to the 1938 hurricane as a, as a bunker that would withstand any storm and be there forever. There was an old parking lot that, uh, because of the retreating coast, ended up in, in the tidal zone. And the waves kind of broke up the asphalt. People were shocked at the time because they didn't understand that there's this coastal process of retreat going on here. Do you know how long this new bathhouse has been here? It's, it's really only a couple years old, and it's built on on a platform so that the buildings can be lifted and moved back as the shoreline changes. And it's supported on pilings, so even if a, one big storm came and flowed under the building, it wouldn't inundate it. So we're at the south end of Herring Cove. This is a great spot to see all of the companion landforms that make up the beach system. Because we have the surf zone and the inner tidal, we have a series of bars. We have this barrier beach that we're standing on. Normally, you would see a dune system on top of a barrier beach like this. The dune is uh, sand blown in by the wind and peaked, and then beach grass and other dune plants will anchor the dune and uh, create a habitat there. The beach grass uh, colonizes the, the sand pile, and underneath it is this web of poison ivy. And then in these older dunes behind, we have a combination of woody shrubs, uh, beach plum, bay, uh, bayberry, and maybe even some small trees. But those stabilizing plants are nothing when it comes to a nor'east. <laughs> of a big nor'easter. This entire dune system for about 400 meters was wiped out in one storm. When that storm passed, it left an inlet here, which allowed the free flow of tidal energy into the salt marsh. And so for the better part of a year, we had high energy going in and out of the marsh. Now you would think that's disruptive, but it's actually quite productive because those periods of overwash bring new sand into the marsh and elevate the marsh platform so that it keeps up with sea level rise. We can already see that this has healed up since five years ago when this nor'easter happened. We have a platform now that's above high tide, the inlet's gone, and um, hopefully a dune will start to form here that will again reestablish the stability, the dynamic equilibrium of the coast. So that 2015 nor'easter exposed these strange concrete blocks. So these are the footings of a giant tower. They're part of uh, these um, survey towers that were used for doing speed trials of boats and submarines offshore. Just like other historical features on the coast, they tell us where the shoreline was at a particular point in history. So now we know from the old maps that they were behind the dune. Now they're in the intertidal zone, soon to disappear. Another reminder that what we build has to fit into the dynamics of coastal change, that what we build is not forever. So oh, thank you for um, putting up with our uh, work in progress. Uh, we are still editing this, as you noticed, um, and uh, the sound isn't um, entirely uh, even and a lot of things, but hopefully there's an experience and a message there. And um, thanks for watching. Um, happy to take any questions or participate in discussion. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Would you like me to read those questions out from the Q&A? Oh, sure. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, we have a question asking, when were those survey towers built? 
Well, they're on the maps from uh, 1912. Uh, and uh, so they were that era um, and they were, there were four survey towers and they were used to set beginning and ending of a measured mile offshore so that boats and actually submarines could to do, do speed trials. And, you know, some of the, again, that those concrete bounds, those concrete monument footings uh, appeared, they had been buried under the beach for most half the century. And there are still some left in the dunes from some of the other three towers. Wow, that's unbelievable to see how it's, this kind of weather is both covering up and then exposing um, pieces of our past. Um, we have a big question here. What can we expect this weekend with the incoming nor'easter? Well, um, every place is a little different. Um, what we do here uh, out on the Cape is um, we do wave observations. We have a volunteer that goes out and does wave observations almost every other day. And he's been doing it for about 15 years. And that tells us the wave height and direction as it approaches Cape Cod at, a, at this one particular station. Um, that has, is extremely important in determining the energy, how the energy hits the Cape. Um, again, whenever we're having a storm, it's important to get out your tide table and see when high tide is and see if the peak of the storm, uh, when it comes in relation to that high tide. And, you know, it just so happens, as many of you know, that it's a, it's a um, full moon tide. It's a, uh, it's a spring tide. So, this is um, in the, the higher extreme range of tides. So when, I'm sure there'll be some effects from this storm um, because it coincides with um, that high tide. We'll be looking, looking to see what, those, what that data shows us for sure. Um, we have a question about the, the, what factors contribute to the exceptional tidal range in the Gulf of Maine. Good question. And I, I love this question. Um, the Gulf of Maine is sort of like this basin that's perched on the continental shelf. And if you imagine yourself carrying a big, huge basin of water upstairs, what will happen to that water? It's going to slosh back and forth. No matter how carefully you step, you'll get this slosh. And that slosh is a um, it's sort of a, it's, it's in geologic terms, it would be called a seiche, but the Gulf of Maine has a slosh to it back and forth between here and Nova Scotia that's kind of in resonance with the cycle of the, the forcing of the tides by the moon. And so the tides themselves are um, amplified by this slosh. That's an excellent visual, especially for anyone who's not, um, we have a lot of folks coming to this presentation that are not living on the coast. So that's a really great way to imagine what's happening. Well, one little exercise that's fun to do is just look up your tide tables from, look, at, look them up for New Jersey, look them up for North Carolina, look, look at them for Nova Scotia and see how different the tides are in each place and what the maximum uh, elevation of the tides are. And you'll see, you'll be able to chart this. Fantastic, thank you. We have another question. It says, you mentioned the project is working with Cape Cod Seashore, Boston Harbor Islands, and Acadia. Uh, is Parker River part of that as well? Um, I know that beach erosion is a huge problem there. Not for this project in particular, but um, these same tools are available um, for federal and state um, land managers. Uh, the tools of elevation surveys, uh, these LIDAR uh, maps that show elevation, and um, I'm not sure what's going on at Parker River, but um, I know that we're in partnership all across these agencies to, um, uh, to model these changes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Good to know, thank you. We do have two questions related to storm surges um, and the strongest wave. So first is what is the highest storm surge Boston Harbor has seen or can expect to see and kind of expect to see and related to that is where, where, where is the strongest waves in Massachusetts? Well, um, one thing about Boston is that uh, these storm surge have, have to wind their way, you know, through Cape Cod Bay, um, Massachusetts Bay and into the harbor. And actually, I don't, 
I'm not clear on the answer there, whether in some ways that might create higher velocities um, and bigger waves, but it's also, uh, it buffers the energy. Whereas the outer cape, the ocean shore over the outer cape is directly facing that energy. I don't really know the answer to that, but there is a Boston tide gauge and quite often these storms range three to five feet above high tide. So the storm surge, so if you have an 11 foot tide, if you just happen to get, um, you know, bingo, where you have uh, uh, the storm, the peak of the storm hitting at the high tide at a full moon, and then you add three to five feet on top of that, then you can start looking at your elevations. You know, what's, if you live on the coast, what's your floor elevation? Is it uh, below 10 feet? Well, then you might have, uh, you know, five feet of water uh, um, temporarily. And I'll just say, this is kind of what sea level rise and climate change, the first way we experience it is by these temporary floods, these temporary storm surges that come and go. And if your structure can stand, you know, one tidal cycle of flooding, then you have time to regroup. Uh, that's the first defense. Great, thank you. Um, a question related to beach and sand erosion. Do you measure the rate of beach and sand erosion and has it sped up at all in the last couple decades? Yes. Um, so what we do, I mentioned uh, the 1890 surveys. Um, uh, Henry Marindon put down on the Cape about 229 stations and he published the elevations of those stations. And so we go back with our survey with, um, you know, here's a, uh, here's a survey grade GPS unit that we put on a pole and wheel up and down those same profile lines on the beach. And we can see the difference between the curves of how much sand is gained or lost on that station and, and then multiply out the volume of sand that's lost. And so we can do a whole budget for the Cape, for example, of where, where has been losing sand for uh, many decades and where it is gaining in Provincetown, parts of Provincetown and Race Point are gaining sand. The Bluff Coasts of Wellfleet and Truro are losing it. Um, but there's a lot of variation uh, from year to year. And uh, one other interesting thing that you'll probably be hearing about is mapping the seafloor near the, the coast and mapping the location of bars and troughs underwater. And those again, help to buffer the energy and as those move around, you know, it's, it's interesting that the interest in great white sharks has spurred us to use these tools to look for those troughs where sharks might, you know, navigate. But they also are, in a way, just as important for telling us which where the hotspots are on ero in erosion, um, you know, along the shoreline. And often they happen to be where we have beach stairs, where we have parking lots and roads. And so there's are, you know, we're constantly working on a response to where the road and parking lot's gonna be in 10, 20, 30 years. Thanks, Mark. And I know the, the end of that, of your answer, answered a question I had, I was curious about the, what's going on underwater, those, out, you know, offshore, um, what's happening underwater. So thanks for including that. Um, we have a question from an urban ecology teacher in Boston. Um, I was wondering if you know anything about how nor'easters impact the local ecosystem. Are the effects mostly just to do with flooding? Um, yeah, well, actually we're looking at that in a lot of places. Um, coastal estuaries are the, among the most interesting habitats, coastal habitats from uh, an ecological point of view. The estuaries are where freshwater and saltwater mix. There are rivers, there are bays and, um, you know, on Cape Cod, we have Nauset Marsh and Pleasant Bay. We have the Herring River and Wellfleet. Um, those uh, estuaries, so the things that, that are the, the effects that happen from storms are the mixing of salt water, the, the um, surge of salt water upstream um, to areas that don't often get it. Uh, these are kind of the, um, the markers of change. Most, most of the, uh, you know, the, the fauna and flora in these estuarine systems are adapted to the stresses of, you know, being salty uh, one year and, and being fresh another. And they do, they come and go. They, uh, the communities are very dynamic in response to this natural variation. 
But as storms increase, which we, really, we do see increased number of storms, increased storm energy, the plants and animals, the fauna and flora might not have time to adapt. You know, they can't just pick up and move, you know, a whole salt marsh doesn't pick up and move. Salt marshes are, you know, one of our primary um, producers and, and, and nursery grounds and things. And we're looking very carefully. One of the big concerns about salt marshes is that as storms move inland, as storms move water inland, as they get flooded more and more often, then the delicate balance of salt marsh grasses, um, they have to move too. They move up hill to where they can find that sweet spot of fresh and salt of inundation. And we may have to start experimenting, looking at ways to help them adapt more quickly by, uh, you know, a storm would move in sand and elevate the marsh so that it sits at, at the, the right place in the elevation of, uh, in water elevation. Will we lose those marshes as the storms flood them more and more often? Um, you know, that would be tragic for um, both natural resources and for our blue economy, you know, that it depends on it. So uh, that's a long answer. I don't know, did I? <laughs> but hopefully I hit on something there. That was great, Mark. And Sasha, let us know if there's anything more you like clarified about that. Um, we have a, some questions about community science um, work. Does the seashore have a beach profiling community science program or do you track beach profiling in a different way with uh, regularity? Um, we do use some, there are very simple techniques that have been incorporated into curricula for looking at beach elevations. Um, there, you know, the, what, you know, this is, these are like, $12,000 units and um, that go into a system that's really expensive, but um, you can do the same thing with sticks. <laughs> you can do it with meter sticks and siding methods. So um, we have that cu um, curriculum and I can um, link people to it for teaching. Um, as far as uh, citizen science, community science, um, we, well, it's a little bit sophisticated to run these surveys and we do have regular internships. We've had dozens, even hundreds of interns over my um, uh, time here. And, uh, uh, and you know, what, I've, what we find is that um, anyone who is at all technical and can learn the method and be, you know, we have uh, mainly college students that are interns and these opportunities are there. Um, to spend the summer working at any one of our projects. We have uh, um, aquatic ecology interns, we have uh, coastal geology interns, um, and uh, um, they're a big part of our research. That's great to know. I know we have a lot of interested youth um, have been uh, sharing out about these programs. Uh, we have a great question about uh, nor'easters and climate change. How are nor'easters changing with climate change? You had mentioned um, as they are cold water and colder cyclones, if the oceans are warming, will that have an impact on these storms? Absolutely, um, because w one of the drivers of the storms is the difference in temperature. Um, actually, the uh, warmer air over the ocean when it meets um, a polar air mass coming down um, from Canada, the, the bigger the, the difference in temperature, the more energy in that storm. So absolutely, that's gonna, that's gonna be a factor. So that in a sense, will that be creating more nor'easters or will they just be on a larger scale um, in terms of storm, so, storm surge and impact to the, the coast? Well, I, I think a bit of both. Um, you know, the, these extreme temperature differences will, like I said, create um, more energy, more storm energy. But we're also seeing uh, more frequent storms. Uh, there was a little clip of Boston Beach in Truro in that video and showing an overwash there. And when I first started here at Cape Cod in 1991, there was an overwash of that beach. And there hadn't been another one until 2013. That was a big surprise in 2013. And between 1991 and 2013, there had been plenty of time to rebuild that beach, rebuild the dune. 
But now since 2013, there's been no rebuilding of that beach. There's been frequent overwashes, frequent waves um, overtopping the, 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 the dune and uh, filling in the marsh. And, uh, you know, normally there would be a quiet time when that dune would rebuild. We'll see. <laughs> And you just mentioned one of the locations where you filmed um, part of the video. Could you share, uh, we had a question asking where some of the other parts of the video were filmed. Yeah, mo everything in that video, let's see, um, uh, Herring Cove Beach in Provincetown. And um, we chose that as a focus for this study because it has really interesting estuarine area at Hatches Harbor in the north at Race Point. It has uh, several parking lots and a public bathhouse that we mentioned in there. So it's a really good laboratory, both ecologically and as far as our, our facilities. The other places are at Boston Beach in Truro. And then there's a little bit of a clip of a, sort of a, um, a flight footage along the shoreline in Wellfleet in there. Um, that was part of our, uh, we have an uh, introduction to the park film. If you come to the park, you'll see it in our um, visitor center. I think nowadays it's online um, and it's fantastic. It's, it's, it's really a great introduction to the park. Um, thanks, Mark. We have a few other questions. One, is Race Point Beach um, any good for monitoring um, this type of activity? Race Point Beach is super interesting. Uh, because it's sort of the opposite of the other beaches. It's the one place, as, as the Cape turns the corner, the orientation of Cape Cod from uh, sort of east facing to north facing, you know, and it's the, this is the tidal jet between Cape Cod and Stellwagen Bank north, north of it. Um, but the waves kind of drop off, uh, they drop in energy and they drop off the sand here at my knuckle. Race Point um, Ranger Station, Race Point Beach is the place that's growing. It's the one big creating beach on the Outer Cape. And one of the reasons that's really interesting to survey is that as the, as the beach grows, then the habitats behind the beach also grow. So we get dune grass, we get um, that beautiful backshore section where the birds nest between the highest high tide line and the, um, and the toe of the dune, that's um, really wide at Race Point. And it's, uh, you know, it's a, uh, um, it's a favorite for um, nesting shorebirds. That habitat that in other places like in Truro where there's absolutely no buffer um, at the top, at the toe of the, the bluff, between the toe of the bluff and the high tide line and nests would be washed away there. So that's, um, yeah, why Race Point's interesting. Awesome. And we, uh, you sharing that video before it was quite complete was quite a teaser. There's a lot of folks who are very interested in seeing that video once it's completed with the inputted data um, and mapping. And we're curious where, when this video is complete, where will we find that online? Well, our goal is to, to post that video and to use it in presentations when the project is complete. You, you may notice that none of the final model results are in the video yet. Um, but um, we also are go we're going to keep that open for editing so that it, little pieces of that video can be used in talks, in public presentations at our kiosks and online. Um, so I guess uh, keep an eye on our website. Um, we expect the study to deliver its results, you know, the end, by the end of the year. And we'll hopefully we'll have something much more polished then. And we'll be definitely doing some public presentations, whether they're in the visitor center or, or virtually, um, we're going to roll that out and, um, and try to make the most of it. We look forward to that. And I know that our team at Boston Harbor Islands is, is very excited to continue this work with you along with uh, the folks up at Acadia. I think it's, this is going to be a really exciting um, project to, to share out. I would also say it's really great to collaborate across the parks. And, um, you know, we have a uh, a lot of talent, creative talent and, and expertise uh, between these three parks. And uh, it's, 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 it's really um, makes everything better when we can uh, work across parks. Absolutely. Um, we have, uh, I'm going to end it with a, a final question. Just curious about your own artistic side, Mark. Uh, someone's curious if they're able to view your own art in any kind of public space. 
Um, sure. Yeah, there's, well, I show some stuff at the Schoolhouse Gallery in Provincetown. So if you just Google Schoolhouse Gallery in Provincetown, and there's a video uh, that sort of is a background on that, on how I made that, um, that floor map. Um, the Provincetown Art Association and Museum was where that show was. Um, and uh, I think I'm working with a, some, some people who want to promote public art and um, yeah, I'm very interested in like taking, I actually took that map and rolled it out at the Fire Island Visitor Center. I've taken it to schools. Um, it's a little scrappy by now. It's about um, six years old, but, um, but yeah, it's really fun to just roll that out on a playground and, and have people uh, walk around on it. That was one of our questions was curious if it would, if it could travel, hopefully one day it, it makes it up to, to Boston. Um, and Mark, excuse me, <clears throat> I do want to take this last question, um, considering our next presentation is going to be looking at winter water birds, and I imagine we may get a sense of, of some of their habitats out here on the harbor. And this question I, might be helpful to understand some context for that presentation. Um, our, our attendee is curious, why are some beaches rocky and some sandy? Oh, it has everything to do with the energy of the water, energy in the water. Um, let's see. In and the, the Harbor Islands are really complex. If you can imagine all that tidal energy moving in and out of the narrow passages between the islands. Um, so where do the birds go? Where, where are the, mar the marshes? Where's the quiet water? And um, this idea of how frequent are storms and is there, a, um, is there a sort of a refuge behind the beach? Um, this is where salt marshes are critical. Salt marshes really develop in that quiet water behind a dune. So if the dunes get disturbed, if there's not enough sand to keep rebuilding those dunes, then um, it will disrupt um, that, those quieter habitats. Um, you know, there are a few sandy shorelines. There's some bluffs in the Boston Harbor Islands. The bluffs feed sand into those, uh, those dunes. And then those little pocket marshes are key. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you again, Mark, so much. Thank you for your time. Thanks for sharing your expertise and your information. Um, we've really valued having you here uh, to share in our weekend of, of looking at our harbor in new and exciting ways. So thank you again so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for putting up with all the glitches. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's part of the process. <laughs> Hope you enjoy the rest of your day, Mark. Thank you. You too. Thanks. All right, thank you all for attending uh, that session on nor'easters. Um, if you have the time, we'll be starting in about 12 minutes with our next presentation, uh, which will be Boston Harbor Winter Water Birds. So that will be a very exciting presentation from 12 to one. And then we'll wrap up our Winter Wonder Sunday afternoon with a special presentation by our Green Ambassador Sunday Festival focused on Island Edition games. So it'll be a little more interactive to wrap up our afternoon. So please, if you'd like, stay on. We'll see you at noon for Winter Waterbirds uh, and perhaps some games following that. See you in a little bit. <laughs>